This lesson is making asynchronous API calls. The objectives for this lesson are to find out what is asynchronous. We'll see the difference between synchronous versus asynchronous. We'll talk about asynchronous and web API calls by taking parts of our program we've already written and making it asynchronous. So first off, what is asynchronous? Well, it means that we're creating a task that runs in the background. So your program can continue to process other requests even though this other task is running in the background. It's really useful when you need to perform some method that takes a lot of time to process. So we can run many tasks in the background typically. So that's, at a nutshell, what asynchronous is all about. To put it in some context, think about a web browser where you navigate to a web page and the HTML just seems to come up right away and then maybe other things fill in. Well, that's because downloading of images is actually done on a separate thread. So the HTML comes down on one thread, the images are loaded on another thread, maybe you're downloading some scripts, that could also be done on another thread. Now there are only so many threads available within a web browser, but this is how it works behind the hood. Normally our, our internet is so fast these days we don't even know this is happening, but if you were actually to go into the F12 browser tools, you could actually watch this happening. So what's neat is that part of the page can be seen while images are still being loaded, the user can type into the browser, and you can go somewhere else completely before the browser has even done loading that page. This is an excellent example of asynchronous programming happening. If we were to consider a synchronous example where the user makes API calls to get a set of maybe 10,000 products, I mean, that could take a lot of time, right? The problem is if we're doing this synchronously, while that request is being filled and made, that user can't do anything else within the program. He's basically stuck. Now, if we were to convert this to an asynchronous sample, the user makes that same call to get a set of 10,000 products, but that task is actually put onto a background thread so that it can process and wait for that data. In the meantime, while that task is going on, the user can do other work within the program. When that background task finishes, then an event can be raised and then the results can be displayed somehow. What's nice about this is it really keeps the UI responsive. It doesn't mean you're necessarily going to go faster, it just means that the user can go on and do other things while other things are happening. Now let's kind of put this into terms of a web API. So if we're talking synchronous, let's say we assume there's two threads in what's called the worker pool, right? And request one comes in and it's assigned to the first thread that's available to run our API calls. Thread one is now blocked until that request is finished. Then request two comes in and is assigned to thread two. Well, now thread two is blocked until that request is finished. If request three comes in, what happens? Well, request three has to wait until either request one or request true that either of their threads are finished processing their tasks. Now, if we take that same example of assuming two threads in the worker pool and an asynchronous call comes in, request one comes in and is assigned to thread one, but thread one submits an async database call and then releases the thread back to the pool. So now we got a background task going on, but the thread is now free. Request 2 comes in and is assigned to thread 2. Thread 2 submits another background task to do some sort of database call, and it 2 releases the thread. So now when request 3 comes in, it can be assigned to thread 1. Maybe request 3 just retrieves a static HTML page. It can return it and then releases that thread. And then when either of the other async calls are done, they are assigned back to an idle thread, and that data is then sent back to the caller. Now this does not necessarily make your APIs run faster. I mean, if you think about it, it takes the same amount of time to get that data from the server. That doesn't change. What it does do is, is it can increase how many requests can be made to your web server. So it increases the scalability of your web server, and this is called vertical scaling. Horizontal scaling means you're adding more web servers. Well, that's not always viable. So if we can use this asynchronous, we can actually increase the scalability without adding more hardware. So let's get down to the mechanics of how this actually works in the web API. Well, we use an asynchronous 
keyword that we attach to the method. We're telling .NET, hey, we want you to make this an asynchronous call and then actually use a background task when we tell you. So we use the await keyword to yield control of the thread. So when we say return await task.run and then call this get method, and let's say that's the one that's going to go out and retrieve 10,000 rows. Await doesn't mean wait. It means I'm releasing control of the thread so that this background task that's out there running on some other thread of execution can go on its merry way. So the async and await are the two keywords we're going to be seeing and using throughout the rest of this lesson. So what is this task? Well, it's basically an object in .NET that allows you to execute some sort of operation asynchronously. And that task will return a value. It could be a single scalar value, it could be an object. Now work then is performed on some other thread in the thread pool. And we have properties that go along with this task object. There's a status, there is the task completed, is it canceled, has it been faulted? And we usually start these tasks with task.run or task as the generic dot factory dot start new. I want to show you just a small little console application to further drive home the difference between synchronous and asynchronous. What I have in this little console application is a product class. I then have a product repository and I have a get method in here that simply is going to return a list of products. Now, Notice what I've done here. I've done a thread.sleep for about two seconds. So I'm just simulating some long process happening. And then I've got a list of four products here. Pretty, pretty simple. But let's look at the program here. What I've got now is I'm going to come into this program.cs. I'm going to do a var repo equals new product repository, console.write line, starting synchronous task, var list equals repo.get. Then afterwards, I'm going to say it's complete and I got so many back from this list. And then we're done. The synch synchronous task is done. So let's run this. There's the start. Remember, we pause for about two seconds, and then finally it's complete. There's four things in the list, and we're done. But you saw that we had to sit there and wait for this. Well, now let's take a look at the other sample that I have in here. So I'm going to comment this code out. And let's go ahead and uncomment all of this code. And let's take a look at the product repository one more time. But now let's take a look at the get async method. Now what I've done is I have an async keyword attached to the get async. I'm now returning a task that's an I enumerable product. So I'm not just returning a list, I'm returning a task, which eventually will have a list of products in it. Then I return await task.run. So we're saying, hey task, go ahead and run this get over here. Remember that's the two second one. But I'm going to yield control, so there's nothing going to else happen here. I'm releasing control back to whoever called me. So right here, right, I do the console.write line again. I call this, but now, guess what? It immediately starts going here. And we say while not task dot is completed, because we got back a task object, right? I can now write to the write line doing other stuff. And we'll see how long this takes until it's finally completed. And then when it is completed, we'll say getting the list. So we now can go after this task dot result dot to list. So we hit the result property to get our value. And then we can get the count. And then we'll finally say after the async task. So let's go ahead and run this, but I'm going to put a breakpoint right here. So let's run this. Okay, doing other stuff, doing other stuff, doing other stuff, and then boom, we're done. So while that task was not completed, we were in here. Then it finally was completed. We then spit this out. We ended up here. And now we will see in our console window. There we go. Look at that. So then it says getting the list complete and after this async task. So there's other stuff we could have been doing, right? I just did a while loop just to show you. But think about that while loop as being, well, I'm just a web API. I'm going to go ahead and release that thread back to the worker pool, and then I'm just ready for somebody else to come in here and do something. So let's start applying asynchronous concepts to our web API project. So the first thing we're going to do is add a get async method to our product repository. Let's open up our iRepository class, and let's add some asynchronous methods here. So we'll keep our synchronous 
methods down below, and we'll add our asynchronous ones up here. Go down to your product repository class and add the keyword partial. There's a reason why I want to kind of split this off a little bit, so we actually have another class where we're going to make our async stuff. So let's right mouse click on the repository layer here. We'll add a new class, and this one will be called product async repository. And into here, we're going to add code that will be our asynchronous calls. So here you can see now, I've extended the product repository into another file. Same class, just another file. It's just a way to help organize things. I wanted to create my asynchronous stuff over here. And now you can see I've got this public async task list of product get async return await underscore db context dot products dot order by row dot name dot to list async. .NET has already built into the entity framework this asynchronous capability, so it works with asynchronous and await. Let's now add our asynchronous routes in our router class. Let's create a separate class just for our asynchronous calls. Now, you wouldn't do this in real world. You'd probably just choose one way or the other, okay? And I suggest you use the asynchronous approach whenever possible. But I'm doing it here just to keep the, the files separate so you can look at just one versus the other. So it looks exactly like the product router. I've still got the same constructor with a logger and the AdventureWorks API defaults coming in. I've got the URL fragment and the tag name. Now I've in my add routes, I've created an app.mapget with our UL fragment, but notice that now I've got the keyword async in front of the method that's going to be accepting our I repository, and then the await in front of our get async call that passes in our repository. And so if we come down here and we look, there's our protected virtual async task, I result, get async passing in our iRepository so that we have the ability to go after the data asynchronously. So now if we just look down at this code, it looks very similar to what we had before. In the try, we do a list equals await repo.getAsync. So now we're making the asynchronous call. So the entity framework is already set up with all of that. So it makes it really easy for us to just simply adapt our routes now to be asynchronous. And again, after that comes back, we just check to make sure we have results. If we do, we return the OK with the list in it. If there's no results, we return a not found. So most of the code looks exactly the same. The only difference is now the tasks, the asyncs, and the awaits. So now we just have to add this new service that we have, this product async router. So we go up to our extension classes and open the service extension. And where we have our router classes, we just now add our new one, which is our services.addscoped router base, but now it's product async router. Let's go ahead and run because we've now registered this. It should now appear in our list. There it is, product async. Click on this, click try it out, execute, and we get the exact same results as if we would, were doing this synchronously. It's just now that it is running asynchronously we get all the benefits of an asynchronous call. Well, let's add our next method, which is our get async, passing in an ID to get a single record. So let's add that method now. Let's open up the I repository, and we'll add our task to the entity get async now. We then open up our product async repository, and we add our new method to get a single row of data asynchronously. Let's now open up our product async router and let's come down and add our new protected get async, passing in an ID and our repository object, and now making the call to our repo.getAsync, passing in that ID. And then we come back up to the add routes method and we add a new app.mapget to call that. And once again, if we just run this now, we now see our new one appear. We can try it out, put in a valid ID, like maybe 900 or something, and we get our data back asynchronously. Off camera, I went ahead and added the rest of the async methods. I think you get the design pattern now, so 
I just added them back in, but let's take a quick look at each one. In the iRepository, you can see the complete list of asynchronous methods that have been added there to that interface. If we open up the product async repository and we scroll down, you'll see that I've added the search async, the insert async, the update async, and the delete async. So you can see it's a pretty consistent and pretty easy design pattern that you just need to follow from one class to the next. If we open the product async router and we look at the add route, you can see each of the app.mapgets, map.post, map.put, and app.mapdelete. And then of course, they're all here. The search async, the insert async, the update async, and the delete async. So you now have all the samples completed. You can run this and see it appear. I have many full-length courses on my YouTube channel. C-Sharp Fundamentals, Object-Oriented Programming, Minimal Web API Development, Web API Development Using MVC, Start and Run a Successful Business, and lots more coming. Please subscribe to my channel, Paul D. Sheriff. In this lesson, we took a look at asynchronous calls running on a background task. By adding asynchronous in your Web API, it will improve your scalability. So I would highly recommend you do this. And we saw how we created two sets of methods in our Web API. Not necessary. I recommend just doing one set and just do it at asynchronously. Don't even bother doing these synchronous calls. In this course, we created a set of Web API endpoints. We learned to use routing and dependency injection. We called the Web API from JavaScript. We configured Web API for cores. We learned to secure endpoints using JWT. We added logging and exception handling. We connected API calls to a SQL Server database, and we tried out making asynchronous Web API calls. So where do you go from here? Well, learn more Web API programming. We can do it with MVC controllers. I have a course on that here too. You can learn web programming, MVC and Razor Pages, HTML, CSS and JavaScript. You could learn WPF desktop programming, maybe some universal Windows platform programming and maybe even mobile development using .NET MAUI. Thank you so much for watching my course, and I hope you enjoy my other courses that I have available for you on this platform.